Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 89 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. We've been spending a good bit of time exploring slavery and how it was practiced in early America. And this is a good thing because we can't truly understand the history of early America unless we grapple with slavery. Plus, the legacy of slavery still informs how we view race and economic and social issues in our present day. So today, Jessica Millward, an associate professor of history at the University of California, Irvine, will help us continue our study of slavery by taking us through how it was practiced in early Maryland and how one woman experienced enslavement and a transition to freedom. During our investigation, Jessica reveals how slavery started in Maryland and how early Marylanders practiced slavery, the story of Charity Folks, an enslaved woman who gained her freedom, and what Charity Folks' story reveals about how some slaves made the transition from slavery to freedom. But first, there are only 11 episodes left until episode 100, which means I need your questions. What would you like to know about me, the podcast, or my work as a historian? I'm recording this episode in mid-August, and I have found a great historian to interview me, Joseph Edelman. Joe studies the history of media in early America, and our intention is to have him use your questions to drive the interview. So let us know what you'd like Joe to ask. Send your questions to Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com, tweet them to at Liz Covart, or post your questions in Ben Franklin's World, our listener community on Facebook. It's time to travel back to 18th century Maryland. Are you ready? Let's go. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an associate professor of history at the University of California, Irvine. Her research interests include African-American history, comparative slavery and emancipation, and gender and women's history. She's a founding member of the UC Irvine Ghana Project, an educational and cultural exchange program between UC Irvine and the University of Ghana, Lagon. Today, she joins us to discuss her first book, Finding Charity's Folk, Enslaved and Free Black Women in Maryland. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Jessica Millward. Thank you, Liz. Hello, Ben Franklin's World. Thank you for having me. Jessica, we're so excited you could join us because we've been exploring slavery. And we know from speaking with Jared Hardesty in episode 83 and with other historians of slavery that its practice varied by region. And well, Maryland is a new region for us. So would you tell us how slavery got its start in Maryland and how it was practiced there? Slavery in Maryland was present almost at the inception of the colony. The colony was founded in 1634, and by 1642, we have evidence of enslaved Africans being used as laborers. 1662, if we know our early American history, we know that the colony of Virginia passed a law suggesting that the status of the child follows that of the mother. Colonies, like Maryland, quickly followed. So the colony of Maryland followed with a similar law in 1664. So again, slavery was established almost at the time of the colony. Slaves primarily worked in harvesting tobacco until the middle of the 18th century. At that point, the economy shifted, the market shifted, and planters found it more successful to cultivate wheat. And so by the time we get to the 19th century, we have enslaved laborers working on some tobacco farms, on wheat farms, Given the geographical topography of Maryland, it being in some ways surrounded by water, we also have enslaved people working on fishing boats. We have them being longshoremen, doing labor in terms of building ships. Enslaved women would work on the farm doing a variety of tasks, or they would also work in the home. And in some cases, skilled seamstresses might travel from farms that are owned by, you know, the same owner and do specialized tasks. So you have a very vibrant slave community. You have a very diverse labor force. 
And I think that in some ways, Maryland is that colony and that state that in some ways defies stereotype. We tend to think of slavery being large plantations in the South with 200 or 300 people working at what time. In Maryland, you tend to have people in the numbers of 10 to 12 people on smaller farms doing smaller contained work. So in some ways, it's not the typical enslaved experience, if there is indeed an atypical enslaved experience. Maryland does sound like it had diversity in terms of the work its enslaved population performed. Now, did Maryland have a similar urban-rural divide in how it practiced slavery as, say, Boston and Western Massachusetts did? You know, it's very interesting because by the 19th century, we have in Maryland, we have Baltimore, which is a very big, for colonial America, a very big and bustling urban center. So you do have a diversity of jobs that people would find themselves in. They might be hired out by their owner to work in the shop of a blacksmith. They might be building ships. Or they might be tending gardens in the backyard of their owner's house in the urban center. So we have that in Baltimore, but we can't say that for the entire state. Annapolis, which is the capital of Maryland, actually was a town really until the 19th century. It never developed into a booming city. So even though we think of it as a city, it was basically a farming community, a farming and fishing community. I think we can only really call Baltimore this strong urban center. One of the other aspects of slavery in Maryland is because of the iron industry, enslaved people could work in a forge, for example, that was out in the country. And at the same time, someone else could be working within the iron industry in someone's shop in the city. So it's not that neat urban rural breakdown in terms of jobs. There was a lot of overlap. You've given us a nice overview of how slaves worked, either as a laborer or domestic on a plantation, or perhaps performing some sort of skill trade in a city like Baltimore, or even in a town like Annapolis. But we've yet to glimpse what everyday life was like for enslaved people. Would you tell us how slaves lived their day-to-day lives in Maryland? I think everyday life is where their lives are very similar to people across the South. They did not own their own time. They did not own access to their family. They could not marry legally. So what we see in some big plantations in the South where people would work out from sunup to sundown, we do have evidence of that in Maryland. We also have people who have more specialized skills that are able to work in the task system. In the case of Maryland, a task system was more a specialized task as it really related to mining iron, for example, or cultivating tobacco. And it is believed, or historians like us to believe, that the task system, because it was predicated on once the task is done, your work is done, it's believed that it gave people more leeway, more free time to develop other aspects of their life versus the gang system that happened in the deeper South where people work from sunup to sundown. But I think in some ways their life was not very different than anyone else across the enslaved South. The jobs might have been different, but the reality of their lives was actually quite similar. Jessica, we hear skepticism in your voice. You sound unconvinced by other historians' claims that the task system actually provided slaves with more free time. I'm very skeptical. I'm very skeptical because think about it in terms of our day-to-day life. An employer will give you something to do as soon as it's finished. You don't necessarily go home for the day. The work continues to mount. So I'm very skeptical. I don't think that aspect of capitalism has changed. I think where there's laborers and where there's work, you will be worked to exact the most potential from you. What I will say in Maryland that is different than some places in the Deep South is that there were glimpses of freedom. Once production of tobacco shifted to cultivation of wheat, owners did not need their enslaved population full-time, year-round. It actually was cheaper for them to either free some of their enslaved population or hire their population out to other people. It gives enslaved people a little bit of autonomy, even if it means that they can speak to their owner about whom they would like to be hired out to. Or in traveling to and from the site where they're hired out to harvest for that season, they might have these undescribable moments of freedom where they are walking by themselves alone on a road, which for enslaved people, that is pretty significant. This freedom of movement is pretty significant. The subject of Jessica's book, Finding Charity's Folk, is a free African-American woman by the name of Charity Folks. Charity Folks was a person who quickly came to occupy Jessica's thoughts. Jessica, would you tell us who Charity Folks was and why she occupied your thoughts? 
So I first encountered Charity Folks in about 2000. I was conducting dissertation research on slavery and manumission in Maryland, and I came across two documents, one dated 1797 and one dated 1807. The document from 1797 indicated that Charity Folks secured her freedom. The document dated 1807 indicated that her children and her grandchildren secured their freedom. And for a long time, I only had these two documents to weave a tale around. I thought that this was a story I could just bypass for lack of information. But for some reason, Charity Folk's name and fragments of her story became the focus of a dissertation chapter. She was only supposed to be a book chapter. But in some ways, she worked her way into every aspect of whatever. I was writing. But you cannot write a book with only two documents. So I decided that I'd have to step outside of the archive, which is very scary for historians to actually step out of the archive and to talk to real people who might know something about the public history involving charity folks in the city of Annapolis. So once I did that, I started making calls to the Annapolis Historical Society and other avenues in Maryland and in Annapolis. And I found out that there was actually a great public narrative of charity folks. She doesn't really appear in history books, but that's quite ironic because she's very, very visible once you understand what her story is in Annapolis. There's been very prominent historians who've written about the people who owned her. There's been prominent historians who have written about her husband. And the irony is that charity folks becomes visible only if you are looking for her. Like so many enslaved women in the nation's history, you have to be looking for them because the archive isn't meant to house their experiences. So one of the things that happened is I contacted descendants of the Rideout family. The Rideout family were the people who owned Charity Folks. I contacted them just on a hunch that perhaps this name would still resonate. And again, like I found out, her name is very well known in the city of Annapolis. I was invited to the Rideout home. I was shown where Charity must have worked because the home continues to be in the family. And I was able to literally retrace her footsteps. So that's a long way of saying she hung around until I really found a way to map her life without a lot of documents. I literally had to map her life looking at the architecture and archaeology of the city of Annapolis. I spoke with local historians and genealogists that could give me pieces of her story. And once I put the story together, I realized that I had actually had a lot of the documents all along. I just didn't understand how they fit together. Charity Folks' story sounds fantastic as does all the historical detective work you did to uncover it. I know we want to explore both of these topics, but before we do, would you tell us what a public history source is? And how does a public history source differ from all the books, documents, and objects we'd find in an archive? When we think about public history, we're thinking about museums, we're thinking about tourist locations that make history accessible in a way that maybe our books that we write aren't, or maybe going to rifle through the archive is not. So when I say public history, I mean the museums around the city of Annapolis, local tourist sites. For example, there's a place called Reynolds Tavern. At the time Charity Folks lived, it was a tavern where men in particular would do business, they would drink ale, they would eat and what have you. But it also was a place where enslaved people were sold. So when I say that I mapped Charity Folks' life, I literally looked at the city of Annapolis and I tried to find instances where I could see her. One of the places I found her, for example, is her husband had a role in establishing one of the local churches. His name appears on one of the frontispiece. So I literally walked around the city and looked at the public narrative, the public stories about charity folks. And I meshed that with the actual documents. And sometimes I will tell you, Liz, it became very interesting because there was what I found in the archive, which we believe to be fact because it's evidence, it's in front of us. This is what historians live for. And then there's perceptions about charity folks that didn't line up with the documentation. So there's a perception, for example, among locals that slavery was less brutal in Annapolis and that enslaved people had more freedom. I've actually found evidence to counter that. So the entire time I was putting this book together, I was warring between what the popular conception was and narratives that people had been telling through the generations and trying to line that up with actual historical evidence. Triangulating all these sources sounds like a lot of difficult work. Would you tell us more about Charity Folks and what the different sources you found say about her life? 
Sure. So I will start with evidence because I am a historian. And unfortunately, Charity Folks does not enter the historical record until she's an adult. We really don't see her until about 1790 when her owner, John Rideout, is actually freeing one of her children. What I've been able to piece together is that Charity Folks was born presumably outside Annapolis at Bel Air Plantation in 1759. Bel Air is about 10 minutes outside of Annapolis. So this is one of the common stories that is passed around. However, I did not find any evidence to support the claim that she actually was born or had lived at Bel Air Plantation. So in some ways, Charity Folks is like many enslaved persons. Once her life is reconstructed, we are left with many more questions than we thought we would be left with. What can be documented is that Charity Folks lived the majority of her life as someone else's property. She was freed when she was about 40 years old, and we see that she actually, despite the condition she was born into, she carved a degree of freedom and a life after slavery. She was manumitted in 1797, and she made the most of her remaining years. By the time of her death in the early 1830s, Charity Folks had amassed at least four properties in Annapolis. Wow, that doesn't sound like a typical story. That doesn't sound like a typical story. I mean, we could say that it was a success story, right? And that her story resonates because it sounds like it's a success. I wouldn't want to gloss over that too much because from the time that we first see her first daughter being freed in 1790 to the time her grandchildren will be manumitted sometime after 1807, it took nearly 40 years for this entire family to gain their freedom. So we look at it as a success, but freedom was never easy. Right. It was never easy. It was often dangerous. And sometimes it was elusive. So her story does sound very interesting. It does sound very successful. But because of that, I also want to be careful to still represent her life in a way that she would recognize. You mentioned that Charity, her eldest daughter and her grandchildren gained their freedom from slavery. How did they obtain their freedom? This, again, is one of these stories that there's a public interpretation and then there's what I found in the archives. The public interpretation is that she was freed because her owners were very grateful to her. She had nursed one of their nephews, the right out nephews, Horace Gibson, through a very dangerous and lingering disease. So the preparations for her freedom, deeds for her freedom were put in place as a result of the family being so indebted to her for helping Horace Gibson through this very lingering illness. Again, and that's not necessarily what I found. What I found is that it was clear as early as 1795 that the rideouts weren't necessarily going to free charity. There was a moment where John Rideout, the husband, wrote to his wife and he asked her to make sure that she looked after Ruth and Charity, two enslaved people, and he had hoped that more would be done for them at his death than other slaves. We don't necessarily see that there's any indication that John Rideout is going to free Charity. In fact, in 1797, he draws a will and he bequeaths to his wife Charity and several other enslaved people. But something must have happened because there was a lengthy codicil in his will that actually made a provision for Charity to be freed in 1807. Seven. Now, John Rideout died in 1797, and within two months of his death, Mary Rideout signed a grant freeing Charity Folks. Mary Rideout also allowed Hannah and a daughter named Little Charity, two of Charity's children, to stay with their mother through the time that they remained enslaved. And then Mary Rideout also indicated that she wanted to grant freedom to Charity's son. So you see, this is a long story of different legal deeds, deeds being represented. Sometimes the children's names were spelled wrong. So again, it was this long patchwork quilt. What we know for sure is the Rideouts freed Charity folks. The extent to how much she must have bargained with them, the extent to which that she may have bought her children's freedom, the record doesn't reveal that. What the record does reveal is freedom and manumission wasn't a foreign concept to charity folks. Her husband had been manumitted in 1794. Her mother had been manumitted at some point before that. And so we know that this life of freedom was pretty close to charity. She could see it literally looking within her own family. Unfortunately, aspects of how she actually attained her freedom is really lost to the record. I had to rely on the experiences of other women to kind of flesh out what her experience might have been like. But the fact that she was able to secure her freedom, her children's freedom, and her grandchildren's freedom tells me something more was a play than just the benevolence of slave owners. It tells me that there had to be an active campaign on the part of charity to make sure her family was free. Mary Rideout allowed two of Charity's children to live with her while Charity was free and they were enslaved. 
Was that a typical experience for Maryland slaves? It was very typical when I started to look at the manumission records in Maryland. It was actually quite astounding. It didn't happen all the time, but it certainly happened. And part of the reason the children probably remained enslaved was the fact that Maryland passed laws as much as there was leniency and planters were allowed to free their population. For whatever reason, the county governments were very afraid that they would be left with this unemployable class of black people. They were worried that African Americans would find themselves in the almshouse. And the almshouse, of course, was originally not designed for them. The almshouse was designed to take up for landless whites who might find themselves on hard times. So there were laws passed that slaves could not be freed until they reached an age of sufficiency, meaning that they were old enough to take care of themselves. And so what we see is women like charity folks who might be freed and their children remain enslaved, we see that and we can only imagine the heartbreak the mother must have felt. But at the same time, we see these instances where the children are enslaved, but they're entrusted to the care of their free black mother. So again, this is one of those examples of Maryland being quite distinct and very messy all at the same time. We've discussed manumission in the sense that Mary Rideout manumitted charity just as her husband's family granted Charity's mother her freedom. But some slaves received manumission from the courts, not their masters. Would you tell us the story of Letty Ogleton and how she and other slave women engaged the courts to fight for their freedom? And what did it take for slaves to win freedom suits? The great part of looking at court records is you learn so much about people and you learn so much about the way in which they were very crafty and how they tried to bend the law, if you will, to their favor. And so what we see with enslaved women like Letty Ogleton is they found loopholes in the law, right? So just to give a little background, Letty Ogleton is a very good example of an enslaved woman who used what was available to her and sued for her freedom. We don't know much about Letty Ogleton. We know that in September 1810, Letty and her five children, Henry, Michael, Lucy, Lucky, and Charles, filed a petition of freedom with Prince George's County Court. According to the petition, the members of this family were, quote, entitled to their freedom, having lineally been descended from a free woman. So that automatically makes us think, what? Did we miss something? They found a loophole that said that if enslaved people were descended in some ways from a white woman, they could not be enslaved. And there was, in fact, this moment in Maryland's history when there were free white women and free black men or enslaved black men having sexual relations. So the Ogletons based their entire argument on the fact that not that they were descended from a quote-unquote white woman, but certainly that they were descended from someone who was not typically African or African-American. They based their entire case on the fact that they were descended from a woman who was quote-unquote East Indian. And they were able to advance this petition based on the fact that they could prove that their ancestor, Maria Ogleton, did not quote-unquote look black. She resembled more indigenous people. They said that she had long flowing hair and red skin. They spoke about the fact that she was probably descended from Arawak Indians and thus were not African or African American. So getting around this notion of blackness is one way that people used the court system to their advantage. That doesn't mean that they didn't identify as African American, but they were working through these loopholes in terms of whatever was available to them to push for freedom. Another thing that they did is in 1809, the state of Maryland passed a law saying that the status of the child, be it free or enslaved, had to be determined if a woman was going to be manumitted. What this means is if an owner was going to free a woman who had children or the capacity to have children, the owner also needed to put in place whether the children would be slave or free at the time of that manumission document being executed. So in some ways, we know that slavery was tied to enslaved woman's womb, but in some ways, we also know in Maryland, enslaved women were aware that their children had the chance to be freed so long as it was attached to their own manumission. So to answer your question, women used the courts by actually distancing themselves from an African or African-American foremother just to the point that it served their purpose. 
They also could use the 1809 law as a way to navigate for the freedom of their children. And then the other ways they ended up in the court record is they ended up in the penitentiary. They ended up in the jail because they tried to take freedom in their own hands to go around the law and either run away or strike back at their owner. So they found themselves in quote unquote court, but they're not petitioning for their freedom the way other people are. And I should also say that petitioning for freedom was very dangerous. People usually had to have access to a lawyer. Some lawyers were provided by abolition societies. Some enslaved people would bring their suit to court or their lawyer would bring their suit to court and the enslaved would have to live in the county jail in order to be protected by the sheriff because you could imagine if you're suing for your freedom, going back to the farm or the house that you live in with your owner isn't the ideal situation. So it was highly orchestrated and for that reason we have very few enslaved people actually making it to the higher courts in Maryland with their freedom petitions. I can't imagine the courts were anxious to hear these cases or that judges were sympathetic to the African-Americans who brought the cases before them, which raises the question, what types of evidence did women like Letty Ogleton, who claimed to have non-African or African-American mothers, have to present to the courts to win their suits? Like, what evidence did Letty have to prove that she was descended from an Arawak Indian mother? What happens in Maryland, just for a moment, just for a moment, is they allow hearsay evidence. And that allows black people, African-Americans, enslaved people, to trace a biological connection to someone based on hearsay, based on recollections of people in the neighborhood who could say, yes, that is that person's grandmother, she was freed by so-and-so, I'm not sure how the children became enslaved, but they shouldn't be enslaved to begin with. So that's one way in which the law kind of was expanding and contracting to allow for this. At a certain point, though, the courts became very smart and they removed the access to hearsay evidence. And so when they do that, really after 1809, we see a drop in the number of cases that actually make it to the upper courts. What we have prior to that is many court cases being at least attempted at the local level. And by the time it gets to the state level, we see far fewer. So let me just give you an example. From 1780 to 1789, for example, this is right after the American Revolution. People should be energized and trying to act out their new rights of liberty, even though they're enslaved. So from 1780 to 1879, the Maryland General Court of the Western Shore, so this is the highest court in the state, and the only place one could bring a freedom suit. They heard only 11 petitions from enslaved people, even though these petitions might have included multiple plaintiffs. They heard basically one a year, a little more than one a year. So we need to be careful by saying even though there was access to the court system, we know that by and large it wasn't a majority of people that were able to access the courts, especially in Maryland. I don't think that means that fewer people wanted to be enslaved. I don't think that means it at all. I think that we only had a limited number of people who had the resources and had the backing to do this. And I would also say that even though the numbers are low, I would also say that they're still very significant. The use of hearsay evidence proves that Letty Ogleton and other slaves really had an intricate knowledge of the Maryland legal system, which raises the question, how did slaves like Letty learn about the court system And when loopholes like hearsay evidence would be available to them? You know, I think this is a question that could apply to any place in the South. Enslaved people were very, very crafty. They learned how to read. We know that Frederick Douglass learned how to read. We know that Nat Turner knew how to read. We're not sure if Charity Folks knew how to read. But what I will say about Charity Folks is that her owner, John Rideout, was a lawyer. So given the fact that there were manumission documents executed for her family, I would say that Charity Folks gleaned some type of legal education just from being in the house with John Rideout. They also had free black counterparts that were sending them information. You know, the way that the cities and the towns in Maryland were organized, you could have an enslaved person living right next door to a free black person. So I think that this is a case of extensive networks, be it abolitionist networks, be it networks within certain families, enslaved families that might be owned by particular owners. I also think that enslaved people knew which owners had a history of freeing their enslaved people. So perhaps if there was an auction, if there was a sale, they might ask to be sold to a particular person. So there was a lot of negotiations we actually can't see. 
Let's return to Charity Folks' story. We know that she was a slave owned by the Rideout family and that Mary Rideout manumitted her in 1797. Jessica, what was Charity's life like after manumission? What was very interesting is that Charity Folks, you would think, walked into freedom and started a brand new life. In some sense, she did. She walked into freedom with the most tangible piece of property that African Americans had, and that was their family. You know, we would hope it would be a wonderful rags to riches story. The way that the laws were shaped in Maryland, free blacks still had to show a proof of income, right? We're still dealing with these laws of sufficiency, as I call them, or self-sufficiency. The irony that enslaved people labored since the inception of the colony, and then they were freed, and they were perceived to be a problem. So these laws of self-sufficiency meant that free blacks still had to produce a livelihood. So charity folks actually continued to work for the rideouts. The difference is she was paid. So when you think about that, you also want to think about what it must have been like to be free, but find yourself in the same condition. And I don't know if it would be liberating or frustrating. Charity folks also moved into a home we know with her husband, Thomas Folks. The 1800 and the 1810 census shows that Thomas Folks and several African Americans were living with him. So I would believe that would be Charity and her children. What it tells us is that, you know, they were eager to make their own home, their own life. The irony is that Charity folks actually only moved maybe a block or two away from the Rideout family. She still lived in Annapolis. She commuted down Duke of Gloucester Street, where the Rideout house was, to the top of the street at Church Circle, and one street over where her house was. So I don't really know what her life must have been like. I would imagine it was a life full of ironies. I would imagine that as much as she was touching freedom, the fact that she saw slavery everywhere was still overpowering. Was the fact that Charity was a woman affect how she experienced slavery and freedom? Oh, I think so. We know that in slavery, enslaved men had the greatest range of occupations and that those occupations translated into freedom. And so that they might have more, quote unquote, marketable skills, a diverse range of skills, where enslaved women might still only be relegated to being domestics or washerwomen. We know that disproportionately there were free black women in the urban centers that rented boarding houses and some turned to prostitution because there weren't a lot of viable jobs for them. In episode 70, Jennifer Morgan revealed that the reproductive capabilities of enslaved women impacted how they experienced slavery. Charity Folks gave birth to five children while she was enslaved. Do we know how having children impacted Charity's experience as an enslaved and as a free woman? Unfortunately, we don't have any information from Charity Folks herself. So again, we have to borrow from experiences of other women. I start the book by saying that motherhood during enslavement was the farthest thing from freedom. And I would imagine that charity folks felt that way as well. You bring children into the world, you know that they're going to be enslaved unless you find a way to navigate certain loopholes. Unless, for whatever reason, your owner can't afford to hold slaves anymore and they decide to free you. I would imagine having five children while enslaved was heartbreaking. She could not protect her children. She had no real legal access to her children until she was freed. And even when she was freed, you know, two children lived with her, but she still had two children who were enslaved. I think that at many points of her life, her life was heartbreaking because she was the mother of enslaved children. When she was lobbying for her own freedom, I think she thought very little of the long-term impact this might have on her family. I think her initial goal was to make sure everyone made it into freedom. Since we're talking about Charity's family, you note in Finding Charity's Folk that slave families were both rare and the most fragile institutions in the African-American community. Why were slave families so rare and fragile? Obviously, the enslaved families are fragile because members could be sold away at any time. And I guess what I would say, if I had to revise anything, I would say that biological families, intact families, how we traditionally think as a mother and father in the home, or increasingly as we are learning about queering slavery, you know, same-sex parents in the same quote-unquote home or cabin, we don't necessarily see that. What we do see is fictive kin. We see people that are taking in the children of someone whose mother might have been sold. We're seeing that people, in effect, adopt others who might not have another family. So I say it's fragile because 
enslaved people had no power over their family. I say that it's rare because the way in which the sales took place, the way in which biological lines may have been contaminated, it was very common that an enslaved woman might have multiple partners, maybe not of her choosing. So children don't have the same father. But family was still the most important thing to enslaved people. So they tried to piece together family wherever they could. Do you have a sense of how the Folks family lived as free men and women? I mean, what were family dynamics like with some members free and others enslaved? We do. Thankfully, we have court testimony. The daughters, actually, Little Charity and her sister Mary did not get along very well, and they actually took each other to court. And from that testimony, we learned a lot of things about this family. So despite the fact that the family was free, and despite the fact that by about 1810, many of Charity's children had courting someone and they eventually become married, we learned that slavery was always in the background of their relationships. Charity folks probably desired to keep her family members close, but some of the tensions that were born in slavery continued to haunt them. So, for example, Charity tended to have a great fondness for her youngest daughter, who we call Little Charity. And Little Charity remained enslaved after the other children were free, but she also was the person who probably spent the most time with her mother because Mary Rideout allowed her to live with her mother. So the family also thinks then that Little Charity had a lot more power and influence over their mother. Thomas Folks, Charity Folks' husband, thought that Little Charity's influence would, as he say, carry his wife to hell. For their part, Charity's son, James Jackson, and Mary Folks, who didn't get along with Little Charity, they believed that they had been unfairly separated from their mother when they were young, and they felt that perhaps Charity didn't love them as much as she loved Little Charity. And this produced rivalries among the children. So, for example, her son James believed that his mother's preference for Little Charity really stemmed from the fact that he and Mary were taken away from their mother at a very young age. And this sibling rivalry, either between him and Little Charity or Mary and Little Charity, often caused a great deal of trouble. Let me give just one example. So at some point, there was tension between Little Charity, or Charity Bishop as she's known, and her brother James, because Charity folks had a home. She allowed her daughter Little Charity and her husband to move into the home. At the same time, Charity's son James Jackson owned pigs and hogs, and he let them live at the home of Big Charity. I guess this is the only place he could keep hogs in the city of Annapolis. Well, Little Charity convinced her mother to make James remove these pigs, and a violent argument ensued, and James actually drew a knife on his mother and witnesses said he called her quote ill names so charity folks senior never forgot this she never forgave her son she removed him from her will and you know this is not insignificant because by the time of her death she left a property to each of her living children so you know children are children it doesn't matter the ways in which these rivalries form but there was always a rivalry with the children and the youngest little charity the quarreling within charity's family demonstrates that even as free people African Americans could rarely escape the tensions imposed by slavery. Did non-family members experience the tensions of slavery too? Rosa would like to know how free and enslaved African Americans interacted with one another. Well, I thank Rosa for this question because, you know, we are attuned to the fact that perhaps that enslaved people become free. And again, their life changes, right? We have the narrative of Frederick Douglass. He escapes to freedom and he becomes in some ways a self-made man, if you will. We know that Sojourner Truth was freed and she then, you know, becomes an itinerant preacher and then later an abolitionist. For the vast majority of free black people, they still have ties to the slave community. They have ties to the slave community because they might be like charity folks working for their former owner, but working for cash. They might still have family members that are enslaved and they're trying to buy them out of freedom. In rare instances, we have free black people who are actually the owners of slaves themselves. And in Maryland, we're led to believe, or the evidence suggests, in Maryland and Virginia, places of the Upper South, that free blacks owned enslaved people who were actually members of their own family. They would buy them, and the law might prohibit them from freeing the slave because they were under this age of self-sufficiency that I told you about. Or the enslaved person might be an older person, and they're no longer valuable to the owner, but they also should not be freed according to the law because they don't have a sustainable income. 
right? They're too old to work. So in Maryland and Virginia, scholars seem to think that free blacks were buying slaves and they presumed that they were members of their family. But even in Charity Folks' family, her husband, Thomas Folks, owned an enslaved man. And there's no indication this man was related to the family. We do have indication that Thomas Folks didn't own this gentleman for very long and he then freed him. So perhaps the Folks family were actually the free black family that were buying slaves with the intent to free them. We know in other places of the Deep South, Mississippi being an example, there were free blacks that really elevated to a different class standing, a different caste standing, and saw themselves as completely separate from enslaved people. So I think that what we get in Maryland is, like I said, a lot more slippage, but people are people and there aren't absolutes. All I can talk about is the larger trends that I see. Now that you've had the opportunity to research charity folks, do you know whether she left any sort of legacy behind? She did, and this is actually my favorite part of her narrative, because we know from Charity Folk's life that she was skilled in root work, meaning she probably knew in some ways how to be a midwife. We know that she had a deep spiritual presence, and we also know that she was quite an entrepreneur. So when we look at her descendants, we really can see aspects, if you will, of her personality or some of her gifts. So, for example, her son-in-law was one of the 12 wealthiest men of Annapolis. When her daughter, Charity Folks Bishop, died, that would be Little Charity, she owned 16 properties at the time of her death. We have some of the descendants that go into owning different shops and their proprietors in Annapolis. We have other descendants like Hutchins Chu Bishop, who served as the rector of St. Philip's Episcopal Church in Harlem. Hutchins Chu Bishop had a granddaughter named Elizabeth Bishop Trussell, who actually was a clinical psychiatrist at Columbia University, one of the first. She actually founded the Department of Psychiatry at Harlem Hospital. And so you have these very decorated members of African-American society that probably owe a lot of their success to the fact that their family was able to get a leg up, right? They weren't part of the enslaved population that was freed at emancipation. They had been building their family legacy since the 1830s. And I also think that one of the legacies, one of the legacies we can't touch, but nonetheless one of the legacies about charity folks is that charity folks shows us that the enslaved are very, very serious and intent on having their lives told. They're very intent on having their history told. And so they will continue to nag you either in documents or they will show up in public history and museums in a particular way. But they're very sincere in wanting their past to be remembered as well. So I think if there were any takeaway from Charity Folks and her legacy, it would be for people to look greater into their own family history. There's a part in the book where I actually talk about tracking down one of her descendants who I spoke to her her descendant, her name's Liberty Rashad, and I tracked her down. Liberty was actually the daughter of Elizabeth Davis Trussell, the psychiatrist at Columbia. I tracked Liberty down, and Liberty and I had a great phone conversation. But halfway through the conversation, it was very clear that I was talking about Charity Folks Sr., and she was talking about Charity Folks Jr. So she knew all about Charity Folks Jr. or Charity Folks Bishop as she becomes, but she had no idea there was another Charity Folks. So within that one conversation, she learned about a whole new generation of her family. And I think that's part of the job of a historian. And I also think that that's something that someone like Charity Folks would want to leave us with, this legacy of family and freedom and really reclaiming your own past. That's a wonderful legacy. And on that note, we need to move into the time warp. Okay. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if charity folks had not worked as the maid of the governor of Maryland or invested in property? How would her experience as a free African-American woman and that of her family have been different? I think that Charity Folks' life cannot be told without talking about the level of privilege she was privy to. She probably worked in the home her entire life, either wherever she was before she came to the Rideouts and then when she was with the Rideouts. She was bequeathed by Mary Rideout some money. So she had money when she walked into Freedom. And she also got an annual salary, an annual allowance 
from John Rideout's will. So she walked into freedom with money. We don't necessarily see that. Her life could have been the exact opposite. She could have been freed without a pension, without any money, and she might have to rent a boarding house and she might have had to scrape by. The other reality is she might not have been freed. She might have lived her whole life as an enslaved person. So had privilege in a particular way and timing and whatever negotiations took place, had they not aligned, she might not have been a free person. Now that you finally had a chance to tell Charity Folks' story, who or what are you researching and writing about now? Well, I'm always going to continue to talk about Charity Folks because I think that there's so many aspects of her life that we still don't know. And hopefully these details will unfold the more and more people learn about Charity Folks. But specifically for my next project, I'm going to look at African-American women and intimate partner violence during the 19th century. We know a lot about violence that enslaved people experienced at the hand of whites. We know in some cases that was slave on slave violence, but we've yet to go into the interior of enslaved women's lives and look at not just intimate partner violence, but how they responded to this violence. And I don't mean resistance. I mean certain survival techniques as any kind of victim of abuse might adopt. So I'm looking at intimate partner violence in African-American women after emancipation. I'm very interested in knowing what the first 50 years of freedom looked like now that African-American women had legal control of their own body. The other project that I'm working on is actually a genealogy consulting firm. One of the great things that came out of Finding Charity's Folk is that I was able to wed my knowledge of family history with the actual historical pursuit of knowledge. And I'm one of the people that am very frustrated when I hear genealogists say that African Americans cannot find their ancestors because they're lost to the slave trade. We know that's not true. So I've started my own genealogy consulting firm, and hopefully I can help people who feel that their family is lost in slavery. Hopefully I can help them find their folks, literally. And where is the best place to look for more information about you, your new genealogy firm, and how we can get in contact with you if we still have questions about the lives of enslaved and free African Americans in Maryland. You can always email me at millward at uci.edu. You can look at my website, jessicamillward.com. You can also look at my faculty webpage at UC Irvine, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dr. J. Mill. If you're interested in charity and continuing up with charity and the legacy of the book, there's also a Facebook page called Finding Charities Folk. Jessica Millward, thank you for sharing the story of Charity Folks with us and for revealing what life was like for free and enslaved African Americans living in Maryland. Oh, thank you for having me. Charity Folks' story is fascinating, not only for how Charity lived her life, but in how Jessica uncovered it. I mean, Charity's story seemed lost to the past, but Jessica sought it out nonetheless, and she did so by making use of all of the historical sources available to her documents, objects, oral traditions, and architecture. And by using these varied sources, Jessica was able to piece together Charity's story. And what this story revealed is that Charity folks lived an exceptional life. Born a slave, she was able to obtain her freedom, free her family members, and bequeath them property that gave their heirs a great start in life. But as Jessica mentioned, Charity's story was not typical. Charity benefited from the privilege of being connected with the wealthy and influential Rideout family, who not only manumitted or freed her, but also provided her with a job, an allowance, and an informal education in the law. Many other freed women did not have the ability to obtain steady employment. They had to scrape by just to live. So investing in real estate, freeing their family members, and saving money for their future was not something they could do. You can find more information about Jessica, her book, Finding Charity's Folk, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 089. As Jessica's work pairs nicely with several past episodes, on the show notes page, you'll also find links to episodes that are worth either a listen or re-listen. And don't forget, we need your questions for episode 100. Let me know what you'd like to know about me, the show, or my historical work. You can send your questions to Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com, tweet them to at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our listener community on Facebook. And while you're emailing, tweeting, and posting your questions, let me know what aspects of slavery you'd like to know more about, because it's a topic we're going to continue to explore on the show 
and it would be great to address those aspects you're interested in. Finally, I know it's a day late, but happy 4th of July. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.